Take your Bible, if you would, Genesis chapter 1. If you would turn there and then turn, once you get to Genesis 1, uh, I want you to turn to Psalm chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 and Psalm chapter 1. Uh, seemed like there was something else that I was going to do while I was up here. Oh, I know what I'm going to do. Does anybody have a testimony that they would like to stand and give in honor of the Lord Jesus Christ? Anybody, anybody, anybody. I'll leave it open for just a minute or two. And if God's been laying something on your heart and you just want to stand and testify, I'm giving you the opportunity to do it. Dum, 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 dum. Sister Pam, I didn't see you, I'm sorry. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Can I tell everybody what Keith pulled me aside and told me that one day. Can I do that? Keith was a great guy. Loved him. They used to live in Wisconsin. And Keith had built like his little cabin that he was going to retire in. And uh, it was out in the woods. And uh, he was just going to retire out there with his wife and just live out there in the middle of nowhere. Keith found out that he had cancer. And he was basically just going to just let it happen, let it befall, let it take whatever it was going to take from him. And that's how, that's how he saw it. And he said, Mike, one day the Lord got to me and said, Keith, what are you going to do? You've got the house that you wanted. So what are you going to do? You're just going to die and leave your wife out here in the middle of nowhere and just leave her here with no one to get to her, no one that could help her, nothing. And Keith thought about that. And Keith was telling me, we was upstairs, and he was telling me this, and he said, Mike, God told me, Keith, take your wife, sell everything you got, move down to Festus, Missouri, so that when you die, your wife can be taken care of by a church family that loves her deeply. And I think I can truly say, on behalf of everybody in this church, you don't have a single enemy here. You are one, you are one of the best loved ladies that this church has. Can I get an amen out of somebody? Do you believe that her husband, Keith, did the right thing? Yep. And it was not too long after Keith told me that, that I, I got to praying about that. And I thought, you know, I just, I just made Keith a promise that I would take care of his wife, and I didn't really have anything in place to do that. And uh, lo and behold, God laid John on my heart, and uh, John now ministers to all of our widows, and uh, he takes, takes very good care of Miss Pam. And so we're glad for that. Yes, sir, man with Cain. Amen. 
You mean the test was wrong? No. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. Take your Bibles, if you would. Genesis chapter 1 and Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1. Uh, yeah, that's where I want to be. That's what I want to do, and that's where I want to go. All right. I'm going to get my notes in the right order. That's day four. We're in day three, by the way, of creation. So let me get back to day three. There we are. Genesis chapter one and uh, then Psalm chapter one. Let's read Psalm chapter one first, if you would. And uh, I don't have that on the screen, so open up your Bible. And there's, if you don't have a Bible... Uh, there's one in the pew there in front of you. We all use and only use the King James Bible here. So if you need a King James Bible, there's one there provided for you. And the Bible says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. I want you to notice these three things. He does not listen to ungodly counsel telling him <clears throat> what to do, how to live his life, <clears throat> so on and so on. He does not stand where sinners congregate and gather themselves together so that he can hear uh, what they're saying about the church, what they're saying about God, what they're saying about God's word. He doesn't do any of that. He... Um, it does So he does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. He does not stand in the way of sinners. And then the third thing is he does not sit in the seat of the scornful. The, the seat of the scornful is all of those people that you know or people that you've met, people that, that you've talked to, who right now they think your religion is a joke. They think that the, the beliefs that you believe that God is dealing with you with, they think that those things are just, uh, they're just a bunch of nonsense. They're, they're just rules and guidelines for weak people. And uh, they wouldn't give you a, a dime for a whole box of preachers. And they wouldn't give you 50 cents for a whole box of Bible verses either. They want nothing to do with it whatsoever. And yet, God is dealing with you along those lines. God is wanting to bless you. God is wanting to heal you. He's wanting to give you grace. And in doing that, He wants you to not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. He wants you to not stand in the way of the sinners. And He does not want you to sit in the seat of the scornful. Verse 2, But His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in His law doth He meditate day and night. I want you to think about that. Does God's Word... Come into your daily life. Does God's word or something about God's word happen to just creep in to every conversation that you have with somebody? Let, let me just tell you something. If that, if that happens, it's not natural. It really isn't. It is not natural for you to be throughout the day thinking of Bible verses that apply to the things that are going on about you uh, in, in, along in your day. I will tell you that the, the one who brings that to you every day is God's Holy Spirit. It is God's Spirit that whatever situation you're in, you look at, a, 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 you look at a, maybe the condition of somebody's life 
Or you look at maybe somebody that's, uh, that's at the job place where you're working or whatever, and you see their life, and God shows you something about their life, and then all of a sudden, these Bible verses start coming out into your mind. Why? Because you've read them before, and the Holy Ghost is going to bring them to your memory and cause you to remind you of these verses. And then that person's life and the situation they're in at that time is going to make sense to you. And if you are given the opportunity, like if they or someone there asks you, what do you think is happening? Then you can testify and say, look, guys, I don't know much about the Bible, but for some reason, these verses came to my mind. And you're able to reel off verses that you didn't know that you had memorized. Well, you didn't have them memorized, but God had them. He had them stored in your heart and in your mind. And when it was the right time, he puts them right out there in your mouth and you just speak them. That's what I believe. So now, uh, in verse 3, and he shall be like a tree. Think about that. And think about that picture of the tree that I've put on the screen. Um, how the rings in it show. In fact, let me just do this. And make it easier if I just show you the, the picture instead of trying to draw it in your mind. Come on. Mr. Bible verse, Mr. Picture of a tree. Here we go, right there we go. Therefore he shall be like a tree. You didn't know you were going to be like a tree. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. That means that even if a famine comes, you're always going to have enough water to make it through that famine. God's going, to use, God's going to make sure that you are firm and that you are planted firm and you will stay that way because God will always send water your way. You'll never do without. You will be one of the most sincere, one of the most godly, one of the most honest, uh, one of the most holy acting people that the people who are around you every day, that you'll, you'll be the one person that they know that they believe that you are a genuine, born-again, Bible-believing Christian. You're not some fake and phony that goes to church every Sunday and makes a big deal of themselves. And then at, when they're on the job site or when you're at work or when you're in uh, whatever situation you are with them, they hear you cuss, they hear you tell dirty jokes, they, they know that you drink a little bit every now and then. They know things about you that you don't think they know about you, but they know about you. And then do you talk about your church and how wonderful it is that you go to your church. And they laugh at you because they think you're a joke. Amen. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall... Prosper, And I want you to remember that now as we go back to uh, day three of creation. Now, what we're doing is we are looking in the Bible and we're seeing how the Bible show, shows us in the week of the creation how God, number one, makes you a completely new person. So that if you're, sit, if you're sitting here listening to me or you're watching online or you're going to listen to this later. If you know in your heart that you're lost. That if you died today that you would go to hell. God is showing you from his word how he can recreate somebody like you. You might be the person who says, well I don't think God could ever save me. I'm so filthy and I'm so vile and I'm so... Uh, so full of sin, surely God could never save someone like me. Is that true? I mean, how? what is the limit, do you think, that God has where people cross that line and then they can't ever, they can't ever be saved? I'm not really aware. Huh? Only God knows. That's a good answer. So you know what that means? According to the gospel, according to Gary. It means it doesn't matter how lost they are. 
And it doesn't matter how dead they are. No one is too dead that they can't be brought back to life. Amen. In fact, you remember Lazarus, don't you? How long had, had he been laying in the tomb? Four days. I can tell you, I won't, I won't go into details, but I can tell you I picked up a body that had been dead four days. And it's the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. You, don't, you, you would never want the remembrance of the smell. You would never want the remembrance of the sight. You would never want that floating around in your mind, in your heart. It is bad. But Lazarus was that dead. And yet all Jesus did was speak three words. Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth more alive than he ever had been in his life previous to that day. Somebody say amen. 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 Now, turn to Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 3. Pray for Alicia. Uh, she's having uh, one of her lupus spells. and Pray for her. Um, and so what we're doing is we're showing the cycles of how God takes a person from nothing and creates a born-again, Bible-believing Christian out of them. That's how, this is how God does it. So we started out with uh, verse, uh, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So on day one, your life is a turmoil. Your life is a mess. Uh, it's without form. It's void of any, of, of any understanding whatsoever. You don't know the first thing about God. You don't know the first thing about religion. You don't know the first thing about the Bible. But you just know that you need somebody to make a change in your life. Is there some day, is there a religion out there that I can latch on to that is a true religion that can, that can actually change my life and make me a different person, make me a better person? I believe there's men out there who are physical with their wife and they don't want to be. And I believe that those men call upon the name of the Lord and say, God, I want you to drive this out of me. God, I don't know what religion to join. I don't know what church to go to. I don't know what Bible to look at. I don't know anything about it. But God, would you deliver me from this? And I think God will deliver a man from that. God will change his life. He'll change his mind. He'll change his heart. And all of a sudden now, He's a different person, and he doesn't know where in the world that came from. But it, his life was void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, but the Spirit of God was moving. Amen. Day two of creation. Day two is when God took... Um, let me get to it here. Now, oh, by the way, on day one, God said... Let there be light. Man, I didn't pass it up, haven't I? God says, let there be light. So you know what God does on day one? He shows you the light. He turns the light on in your life. For those of you who believe that there really is nothing wrong with you. But let me tell you, there's something wrong with you. Amen. Amen. All you got to do is ask a person's spouse. All you got to do is talk to their kids. All you got to do is find out from the people they work with. Is there something wrong with that guy? Oh, yeah, there's something bad wrong with that guy. Okay, I'm here to tell you, God will turn the light on, and all of a sudden now you're going to see things that you never saw before. You're going to see the light, the gospel of Jesus Christ shining down on your life. That's day one. Day two of creation, God took and he divided. Remember, uh, this was last week. God took the, the waters that were below and the waters that were above and he divided them. So we have water on the earth. But if you go up in the clouds, there's water in the cloud line. If you go above that, there's another, actually another cloud line up there above, above I don't know what thousand feet it is, but it's above that. Then you leave this earth and you're in outer space 
And God built space so big and so immense and so huge that we have no idea where the end of the heavens are, but we just know that between the end of heaven and where God's heaven is, the third heaven, where God dwells, we just know that there is a, a river of water that is separating. I mean, think about the Red Sea, how the Red Sea separated God's people from the mountain of God. Think about, um, think about the, um, um, when the Israelites were coming back into the promised land, they actually had to come from east and go west, and they had to stop up the river Jordan. They, the, the Levite priests were carrying the Ark of the Covenant, and when they stepped the, their foot in the, the waters of the Jordan River, the, river, the rivers of the water stopped, and they were built up into a heap, and the Bible says that the waters just built up and they got higher and higher and they started going back farther, farther, and farther, and farther to where, to where nobody could see where, how far back the waters were going. But they just knew that if they walked through that area, they were going to walk on dry ground and God was going to give them passage from one side to the other side of the water. And that's God dividing the waters. But the main thing about that thing in day two where God divided the waters from the waters. He called the waters up here heaven. He called the waters down here. They're on the earth. And the Bible says that there is, there is God's thoughts about you. God's thoughts about your life. God's thoughts about your future. The ways that you handle things. The things that you do every day. God's thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And they always will be. You will never outsmart God. You will never impress God with things that you thought before. It will never happen. That's day two. Now day three. Oh, I've been waiting to get, get to this one. I woke up this morning going, oh, I get to preach this. Day, day three, I meant. Come on now. Did I put there it is. Genesis chapter 1 verse 9. Read along with me. And God said, let the waters under the heaven, you don't like this, be gathered together under one place. And let the dry land appear. And, and it was so. So in verse 10, God called the dry land, earth, duh, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. Makes sense, doesn't it? That's what we call them. Huh. So, and God saw that it was what? Good. The way he had it, it was was good. So I'm going to ask you a question this morning. And then we're going to pray before I get too far. Would you like for God to say of your life, it's good? Would you like for God to say of your marriage, it's good? Would you like for God to say of of anything that you do in this world, that is, God is watching you, God looks at it and says, it's good. Sure you would. You, I would like to be like that tree planted by the rivers of living water. So I'd never run out of something to drink. Father, I ask your blessings on your word this morning. I thank you, God, Lord, for giving it to us. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would give us understanding. Let there, Father, be no doubts in our minds whatsoever that all of us may know and understand the words that are in this sacred book. God, that you would make them real in our lives. And teach us, Father, things, great and, great and mighty things that we know not. Teach them to us this morning so that we all can rejoice in your word. Bless your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. So God called that, He called it good. And He said after that, 
uh, in verse 11. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. Now remember, we just said that God uh, pl planted the trees. They had fruit coming off of them. They dropped on the ground. The seeds came out of them, fell on the ground, and those seeds then went through the process that seeds go through. The seeds corrupted. The seeds died, fell into the ground, the seeds then were opened up and a new tree came out of that seed. We understand that as the teaching that the Apostle Paul gives us in 1 Corinthians 15 of the resurrection of God's saints. That on the day that it is appointed for you to die, God is going to drop you into the ground and what's on the inside of you is going to come out of that husk that covers that seed. Doesn't matter if it's corn, wheat, barley, grape seeds, banana seed. Doesn't matter if it's mustard seed. Doesn't matter if whatever kind of seed it was. That husk has to come off of there. And what's really on the inside of it is what rises up. And here's the beauty. This is what Paul was getting at First 1 Corinthians 15. He said, imagine this, that whatever comes up out of the ground doesn't bear any resemblance to what you put into the ground. Now there's where you ought to be saying your amen at. That you're not going to be ugly forever. Or I'll say it like this. I'm not going to be ugly forever. All you got to do is wait till he goes to sleep back there and you can go back there. Pow! Got you. Okay? So think about it. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. And he shall bring forth his fruit in his season. And so here we are on day three. And that is exactly what God has shown us this. This is the time now when, when God has planted the seeds... And the earth is going to bring forth that which is planted down in it. But it's not going to look like what was planted down in the ground. It's not going to look like that. It's going to look better than that. Fruit trees are pretty. Amen? Flowering plants, all kinds of flowering plants are beautiful. They're pretty. They smell good. All kinds of good things. Those are the things... That God, that please God, that honors God, that God, the Bible tells us in, in uh, John chapter 15, Jesus is talking about how that he said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and my words abide in you, uh, you shall ask what you will and my father will give it to you according to his riches and glory because it blesses God when what comes up out of the ground that he's planted, it blesses God. The beauty of it is what makes God happy. And when God plants you in the ground, it's not so much death as it is its planting season. And now we're going to wait for the harvest season to come along. And God's going to raise whoever that is up from the ground and they're going to be far more beautiful than they ever were down here on this earth. Somebody say amen. Oh, listen, I'm, get, I'm liking this. Now, uh, let, me, let me finish reading here. Make sure we get it all. Verse 11, God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was what? Good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. Now, Ephesians 10. I want you to think about, uh, let me go back here to Genesis 1. 
we see that God took the waters and gathered them together into one place. Now I'm going to tell you what that means, or I'm going to tell you how it, how it is applied in this message. It can have multiple applications, multiple meanings. I'm going to tell you where it is I'm going with it. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, the Bible says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, He, meaning God, might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, even in Him. He's talking about the translation here, the rapture. Uh, people call it uh, different things, but that's what he's talking about. That one of these days the dead in Christ are going to rise. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Somebody say amen about that. I can't wait to see Jesus in all his glory. Can't wait to be glorified with him on that day where I don't, I have, my back is killing me today and I'm hurting. One of these days God's going to flush all this out and I'm going to be a different person. And I can't wait for that to happen. God's going to gather us together. Look at Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13. I want you to turn your Bibles there. Matthew 13 is a chapter that is loaded from top to bottom with seed stories. Matthew 13. It is full of seed stories. It tells you every which, every which way, everything about seeds that there are in this world. It tells you all about them. <clears throat> yeah, you, you have in Matthew 13, you have the parable of the seed and the sower. Um, and let, let me just say this to you. In the parable of the seed and the sower, four groups of people hear the word of God. Only one of those groups goes to heaven. Only one. I, I wouldn't do this. I think, I think we have a better chance just in this congregation that I think the odds are better than uh, three to one that only one out of four groups of people would go to heaven. I think the odds are better in this church room. Don't you think they're better? Okay. Hopefully there's more people saved in this room than there are lost. Okay. But anyway, that's what, that's what it's about. He, pre, he talks about the seed and the sower and some of it falls by the wayside and the devil comes and eats it up so that no man gets any blessing out of it. Then some of the seed is planted uh, in, um, in uh, stony ground and that stony ground has to be plowed up and has to be softened up and that's never done and that stony ground you know what that represents that represents a person whose head is so much against God and the gospel of God that they think they're smarter than God about everything and you know where they're going to spend eternity? In hell. Then you have the seed that was sown among thorns. Thorns are what God cursed the ground with in Genesis. After Adam and Eve sinned, God cursed the ground with, with thorns. And he said, Adam, you're going to plant uh, your, your wheat, your barley, your corn, whatever it is. But really, all you're going to get up out of it is thorns. And you're going to have to work to really get those thorns and those thistles out of your garden. You're going to have to work at it, Adam. That's how it's going to be. And a person who will not spend his time laboring in God's field, the field of your life, if you will not spend time laboring in the field of Almighty God, the field of your life. Hey, it's your life. You decide what's going to happen with it. You decide whether or not that your soul is worth saving. 
You decide whether or not your life is worth changing. You decide. And if you just say to God, God, I just, you know, God, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I would just soon, I would, I would just soon keep my sins. I don't think I can ever change. Then God says, okay, that's fine. You'll be sown among thorny ground and you'll bear no fruit. And you're going to die in that condition. And then we have the seed sown uh, to the good ground people. And those are the people who uh, God has plowed up the, wor the, the, the uh, fallow ground of their life. And they, they are now ready to receive the seed of the word of God planted in their life. And once it's planted in there, it grows, it blooms, it blossoms. And you can tell that it's just going to do well. It's going to bring forth much fruit. And that's exactly what it does. And buddy, I'm tell you what, God rejoices. All of the angels rejoice. Heaven rejoices. Your family rejoices and says, oh, this is what we've wanted so long. God, this is what we've needed so long. It's for our daddy to get saved. It's for our mama to get saved. God, that's what we've needed all these years. It's for the day when they finally, finally gave up living the life they were living. And finally said, I'm going to go live for God. Oh, what a day that would be. Amen. Uh, then you have the parable of the, uh, the, the wheat and the tares. The wheat is sown out into the, the ground. But the enemy comes and sows tares out. And I won't get into all that this morning, but that's one of the stories there that you find there in Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 13. Now, uh, everybody turn to Hebrews 10. You know, I should, I should preach on Matthew 13. Man, I should. I'll see what God says. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Because I want to tell you what this gathering is about. The hint is, you're doing it right now. That's the hint. Hebrews 10. These are very, very, it's a very, very simple verse. Hebrews 10, 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. As the manner of some is. But exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And what God was showing us way back in Genesis chapter 1 is on the third day. Is when God took all the, all the earth and gathered it together. And then he took all the water and gathered it all together. So that there was a difference between... The ground, the earth, and the seas. And everybody knows there's a difference. God's gathered the ground together. And then God gathered the waters together. And there they are. And they like one another. If you're water, you like being around other people that are water. If you are ground, you, are, you like being ground because you like being with other people that are ground. Now... Make the application however you want to. But the bottom line is, is that God knows you. God knows you, my friend. He knows you inside, out, upside down, crossways, slantways, backwards, forwards. God knows everything there is to know about you. And you cannot fool God can't do it and so a lot of people they say of themselves oh I believe I'm a I believe I, I believe in God I believe in Jesus I just don't believe you got to go to church to believe that <clears throat> well let me let me help you with that No, you don't have to go to church to prove that. But I can also tell you that if 
you really do like being around other Christian people, you'll find yourself gathered with them when they gathered together. You'll find yourself wanting to be with them. You'll find yourself that when days come and things happen and you can't get to church or we, we had COVID here go through here a while back and I had to shut it down again for another Sunday. Boy, I hated that. I hate that COVID, man. And I had it too and it was just, it was awful. But we were looking at the number of people that had it and so we had to shut the service down again. I thought that would be the last time we'd ever done it back in 2020. But here we are doing it again. Thanks, Joe. Well, now we can just blame Kamala Harris, I guess. But I just, I didn't like doing it, but that's what I had to do. I remember years ago, back not too long after Lisa and I first got married, uh, I pastored a little church in the, in the woods down in Richwoods, Missouri. Down, down around Highway 47 uh, and uh, Highway A. And um, nice little church, great people, I loved them. And in Richwoods, I found out about Richwoods, there's, there was only two kinds of people in Richwoods. Bad people and good people. And if you were bad, you were really bad. And if you were good, you were really good. Well, anyway, we had a, a service where um, some ice moved in on a Saturday. And it kept us all from being able to get out of our driveways. And so I had to call everybody in the church tell them we're not having Sunday service that Sunday. So then, um, the next Sunday came around. Lo and behold, the ice came down again on a Saturday. And they had just got it, all the other old ice cleared off. Now there's more, this pellet ice falling down. And now we had to schedule a second service where we had to dismiss it. Then, the third Sunday came around. And the forecast was, lo and behold, more ice more freezing rain and I said to my wife I said I'm having church I'm going to I'm going to drive down there on a Saturday they had an old house that they had a preacher before me live in there and so I had a house to stay in and so on and I said I'm going to spend the night there and and uh, I'm going to have church and if anybody can walk there then they can walk there and we'll have church but I you know what happened to me by the time that third service came around, I didn't, I was kind of getting used to not going to church. You know what I was going to do, Jerry? I was going to go down to the, uh, the grocery store, shopping table, whatever it was there in Hillsboro, and rent a couple of movies and watch them. And I had to pull back for a minute <clears throat> And I thought about that, and I'm going, I can't do that. That's the Lord's day. So I told Lisa, I said, the girls were little. They were little. And I told Lisa, I said, I'm going to go to church. I can't, I don't, this ain't right. I don't like it. I don't like how I feel. I, all I want to do is just not have church, and I don't want to be that way. And so I called the deacons and I said, we're going to have church. I don't care what happens. I'm going to be in the house. Can you go down there? They had propane gas uh, heat in there. And I said to one of the deacons, can you go to, oh, hush. Can you go down and can you um, get, that, get the furnace going for me because so, I'm going to spend the night there. They said, sure. So I drove down there on a Saturday and had plenty of food to eat and just kind of hung around there at the church that Saturday night. Sometime in the night, the pilot light blew out on the water heater. And I took probably the coldest shower that Sunday morning that I've ever taken in my whole life. Woo! I got the Holy Ghost in me. But you know what? We had church. And I, I told the church how I was feeling, and I said, this ain't, this, this, ain't, this ain't me, this ain't who I am. I don't want to be this way. 
but you make me sit out two weeks in a row, that's really all it takes for me. And all of a sudden, I like finding myself out doing something else besides church. I don't ever want that to happen again. You see, because when you are saved, this is what God, this is the sign that God's given you that you really are born again. No one makes you come to church. I don't call people in the church and say, Hey, you better be here Sunday morning or we're going to cast you out. You got, you got it? We'll throw you out. Never do that. I just think that when you like being for God and like being on God's side of things, that you don't, you don't like it when God doesn't gather us together in his name. Somebody say amen. So he says in Matthew 24, look at this. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And what's he going to do? He shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. That's what I like about what we're going to do next week. It is a lot of work. For a lot of people. But it's worth it. I've never, had, I've never had a homecoming where we said, Well, that was a big mistake. I don't care how many show up. It's always worth it when we can open up our doors to all these faithful people that watch us. I mean, they've been watching us since we started streaming in 2011. They have been faithful to us all of those years since that time. And we open up our doors for them and we tell them to come and be part of us and we visit with them and we talk with them for a while and they get to meet us. And we, but we never show them where Area 52 is. Don't, don't, don't ask. <clears throat> anyway, uh, Matthew chapter 13, He spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he had sowed some seed fell by the wayside, I've already talked about this. And the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth. Forthwith they sprung up because they had no deep, deepness of earth. And when the sun was set up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. Listen, get in a church and plant roots in there. You know why you do that? Because if you don't, then the littlest thing that comes along that's the least bit offensive, you'll be out. But if you'll plant roots down inside the house, you get to know God's people. You get to find out that they're not perfect, just like you ain't perfect. And all of a sudden now you've rooted, you've rooted yourself down in there. And you've decided this is where we're going to raise our children at. This is the place we're going to send them to Sunday school. This is the place where we believe that, that when they go away from us to that Sunday school room, we know they're going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ from the word of God. Amen. Amen. You've got confidence in that, that that's what's going to happen. I can tell you that that's what I believe happens. But you plant you grow roots inside the house of God. And I want to tell you something. They ain't nothing can make you leave. Great peace have they that love thy law and nothing shall offend them, the Bible says. Amen. In Matthew 13, again, uh, he's going to tell you that what the parable of the sower means. We've already covered that. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, look at this. Verse 6, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. See, it falls on somebody in this church to plant the seed of the Word of God. It falls upon somebody else in this church to bring water to those, uh, uh, to someone who is dry and thirsty and needs water, and you get to be the water bearer for their lives. But then it's God that brings the increase. And I like it that way. That way, none of the blame, none of the, none of the glory, none of that falls in any place upon me because I don't want it. If someone in this church, 
Let's say, let's say you're one of these families, you, you've just been coming here just for the past few months. Five years from now, you're still here. It will be because God sowed, He planted you, He watered you, you grew roots, you became strengthened, and all of a sudden now, you are one of us, which that's scary, but it works. Anyway, you become one of us, and you like it that way. And you don't want it to be any other way. This now has become your church. I'm here to tell you, I'm not getting younger in, in this church. I'm not. I'm not getting younger. I have a, I have a, uh, a, a policy, a life insurance policy that has something built into it for the eventual date of my um, retirement. I don't plan on retiring. I don't plan on it. But we never know what God may bring along and God just may take me out and send me home one of these days. This church will need to be strong enough with roots deep enough so that you say, you know what? We can't replace Brother Mike. So we're just going to ask God to send us the next man to take us in the next generation or in the next way that we're supposed to go. And God will do that, and you'll love it when he does. It's because you better not be here because of me. You better not. If you're here because of me, you'll leave because of me. Am I right on that? Amen, amen. First Peter being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. God is in the seed gathering business, the seed planting business, the seed sowing business. God is in that business. And so now what's happened in your life, you, you're saved now and you're growing. And all of a sudden now, without you really doing much of anything, all of a sudden now sprouts are starting to come out on you. And you're growing the, the possibility of the next person in the world who's going to get saved. You're bearing in your body the fruit of the seed of the Word of God. And God will, one of these days, use you to bring somebody into His kingdom. Somebody say amen. I'm, I don't know how, I don't know if you've ever experienced this. But to know that God used something that you did to bring a sinner to salvation is one of the best feelings I've ever had in my life. Nothing, nothing is better than that. I'm telling you, it is awesome. So I'm going to ask you this morning, are you being fruitful? Are you being fruitful? There is uh, a different kind of fruit, and I don't have time to bring it to the, bring it into the teaching. I may do it this evening, but I may not. I don't know. I've called it, and people who've heard me will recognize this. It's the vine of Sodom. You see, there are two types of fruit mentioned in the Bible. There's the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of holiness. But there is also the vine of Sodom. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, if you're not careful, the seed that will be manifesting in your life will not be the joy of the Word of God. It'll be the bitterness of the seed of Sodom. And I'm here to tell you, 
You don't want that on your conscience. To know that somebody died, went to hell, you had an opportunity to change their life, but you didn't do it. You sowed to them the seed of Sodom. I will carry with me to the grave people that I should have witnessed to that I didn't. People that I should have spoke the right things, believed the right things, manifested the right kind of fruit in my life. But I didn't, and there isn't a thing I can do about it now except for confess and beg God's continuing forgiveness. Let's bow our heads for prayer.